Good evening. Uh, I'm Paul Verstein, the chair of the Jewish Studies program here at the University of Washington. Uh, I'd like to welcome you. Now, tonight's speaker, this year's speaker, is Professor Aaron Rodrigue, and his topic, as I'm sure you know, is Sephardi Jewries and the Holocaust. Professor Rodrigue was born in Turkey. He got his bachelor's degree at the University of Manchester in England and his PhD from Harvard University. He's now the Eva Chernov Loki, Professor of Jewish Studies and Professor of History at Stanford University. Among his books are Sephardi Jewry, A History of the Judeo-Spanish Community, the 14th to 20th Centuries, with Esther Ben Bassa, and Jews and Muslims, Images of Sephardi and Eastern Jewries in Modern Times. Professor Rodrigue's topic tonight is the Holocaust and the end of Judeo-Spanish culture in the Balkans. Please, Professor Rodrigue. It's a great pleasure and a great honor to be here. And um, I would like to thank the Jewish Studies Program for its invitation to, to me to deliver the Strom Lectures this year. And of course, I'd like to thank Samuel and Althea Strom, whose generosity has created a remarkable and prestigious uh, uh, lecture series that has initiated numerous significant projects and publications in the fields of Jewish studies. It really is a remarkable honor for me to be here continuing, especially in the 30th anniversary of, of this series. Um, thank you again. In March 24, 2003, a new plaque was placed in the memorial monument at Auschwitz-Birkenau. And I read the following text. It's in Ladino. Que este lugar donde los nazis exterminaron un millón y medio de hombres, de mujeres y de criaturas, la más parte judíos de varios países de la Europa, sea para siempre, para la humanidad, un grito de desespero y unas señales. Auschwitz-Birkenau, 1940-1945. I translate, forever let this place be a cry of despair and a warning to humanity where the Nazis murdered about one and a half million men, women, and children, mainly Jews from various countries of Europe. Auschwitz-Birkenau. This, by the way, is a regular translation of the English plaque, which was displaced to make room for the new one in Ladino. Now, the remarkable thing about this plaque is not that it was placed there, but that it was 36 years after the memorial plaques in languages of all the victim groups that had suffered in Auschwitz-Birkenau were placed in the memorial in 1967. It is only then, therefore, uh, in 2003, that Ladino entered this memorial. This delay, I think, is emblematic of the oblivion um, with which the um, disappearance of Sephardi communities uh, in the Holocaust has met throughout the world until fairly recently. And a lot of popular misconceptions still remain. On the whole, if uh, the average question is asked, uh, the, to the average uh, 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 person, um, and actually in the scholarly community as well, uh, very frequently the remark will be that the Sephardim were not affected by the Holocaust. Specialists do know about, uh, of course, the fate of the, uh, of the Sephardim, but um, this has not really uh, uh, got much attention. And the issue has itself, I think, continued in numerous different ways, even in literature that has had very deep 
kind of uh, imprint on the memory of the Holocaust. For example, in Primo Levi's survival at Auschwitz, uh, there are regular occurrences of Greek Jews. There are, in fact, uh, mention is made uh, that these Jews spoke Spanish occasionally, uh, but the word Sephardi does not appear. Now, of course, Primo Levi uh, was not, uh, he, he was under no obligation to mention the word Sephardi, but even in very frequent uh, popular and, and literary representations, unless the specialist knows what this refers to, uh, the uh, knowledge and the understanding of the place of the Sephardim in this catastrophe is uh, usually absent. Now, I'd like to think aloud here and to talk uh, a little bit about a few hypotheses uh, I have as to why this is. Um, the first one is perhaps that the Holocaust has been associated with a European phenomenon, as it was indeed largely a European phenomenon. Uh, Balkans, in which, of course, the Sephardim lived, the southeastern Europe, usually exotic, not thought of in exotic terms. And in general, especially after uh, uh, World War II with the great migration of Jews from Arab lands, the idea has grown that in fact Sephardim are not really Europeans and therefore if the Holocaust is European, the Sephardim are not really part of the Holocaust. It's one idea, one uh, hypothesis. The other thing, uh, the other hypothesis would be, or another factor would be, the relatively small numbers uh, compared of course to the millions uh, of Ashkenazi Jews. We are talking about in the hundreds of thousands as far as the Sephardi communities were, and there was a very big demographic change in the course of the 17th and 18th centuries, and Sephardim, who had been the majority of the Jewish people up until then, were rapidly overtaken and became a much smaller minority by increasing Ashkenazi numbers. So, in fact, this was a smaller community, and in fact, the survivors <coughs> were also therefore fewer, and also many of them, of course, did not emigrate to the West, uh, where a lot of these uh, uh, ideas about the old world left behind uh, was uh, disseminated in the Jewish communities uh, in, the, in the contemporary times. So there is an issue of critical mass. A third uh, idea, a third hypothesis we can say, is um, the long time stress in Holocaust studies on perpetrator history, that is to say, Holocaust studies on the whole has really developed as a whole field of inquiry, analyzing minutely and dramatically and with great detail the, uh, uh, the doings of the Nazis, the Germans, the plans. Uh, and uh, on the whole, very frequently, the victims were objects in a lot of these studies. And when people from the victim's perspective began to do the histories about, for example, Jewish life in ghettos, uh, in Eastern Europe and other kinds of uh, studies, of course they focused yet again on the majority of those populations in w in w from which there were actually uh, 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 m many records that survived uh, and uh, whose descendants themselves were of course involved in their histories. Therefore, the story has remained uh, yet again, uh, overwhelmingly focused on the Ashkenazi communities. There is also, as a fourth hypothesis here, a much larger issue, one that I have had to deal with throughout my scholarly career, which is that for a very long time, Sephardim post-expulsion, certainly post-17th century, once they are in the lands of Islam, uh, have dropped out of the narrative of Jewish history. A lot of modern Jewish history has been remarkably Europe-centered, has had great difficulties integrating this history of Jews in other areas, usually defined uh, as exotic, uh, as distant, and usually entering uh, the realm of scholarly discourse through the study of folklore, but, and not uh, through the study of history. This has begun to change. It has been gathering steam, I'm pleased to say. But of course, one end result of this is that the end of that story in some ways, the Holocaust itself, has not yet uh, become part of the central narrative of the Holocaust itself. And one final hypothesis here. And that is um, what I would, might call the tyranny of the nation state paradigm in the study of the Holocaust. 
Uh, that is to say, most studies are country by country. Uh, Polish Jewry, uh, Lithuanian Jewry, Russian Jewry, French Jewry, etc. in terms of uh, uh, the way, for example, the Germans come in, the way they, they organize the process of destruction, the way they actually uh, uh, implement this, and Jewish reactions and Jewish life in those particular kind of contexts. But this, uh, which is a natural result, in fact, of the way that the history as a discipline was organized around the nation state itself, and is really in some ways the handmaiden of uh, uh, nationalism and the nation state itself operated in a similar way in Holocaust studies. And yet this approach uh, has a way of flattening out certainly a much more complex and much more variegated history when it comes to other groups than the strictly national. Uh, groups like Jews who have other geographies, other narrative, other spaces that do not necessarily easily and smoothly fit the nation state paradigm. And in fact, there is in and of itself some absurdity to uh, part of that paradigm itself. For example, even in the Ashkenazi world, when we're talking about Jews of Poland, Jews of Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, well, those uh, countries really became independent in the modern period only at the end of World War I. What in that description, for example, of Latvian Jewry do we really convey as far as the history of the Jews in that area are concerned? Aren't there other stories, much larger stories, of which these groups were uh, an integral part of? Yes. This is true also, uh, especially of the Sephardi world, but it, what I'm saying can be applied, of course, to the Ashkenazi world itself. When we talk about Greek Jews, we are talking about a Jewish community, the bulk of the population of which lived only 30 years after 1912, uh, when Salonika is conquered by uh, Greece, only 30 years under Greek rule. Now, of course, they were in the process of becoming Greek, of becoming Hellenized. The younger generation were being educated in Greek schools. They were uh, being conscripted into the army. They were meeting the nation state, as it were. And yet, that community, the Salonika community, for example, which made up the bulk of the population of Greek Jewry, was in fact part of a different and completely separate reality, a very different reality for four centuries, an Ottoman reality. So when we do Holocaust studies under the rubric of what happened to Greek Jews, for example, and then when we want to study what is uh, happening in this area in terms of the community and trying to understand uh, their history, we miss a completely different other uh, dimension altogether uh, if we remain within that uh, particular paradigm. So tonight, having outlined some of these uh, reasons and hypotheses that I have about why this story may not have yet been uh, foregrounded, I really want to excavate this different Jewish geography, which is a transnational, non-national geography uh, and unit and culture uh, that is uh, uh, really rooted in multiple other optics and uh, perspectives. And before I proceed, I think it's important to lay out the fact that until 1939, there were really, as far as the uh, Jewish world in Europe is concerned, two heartlands, two core areas that had come into being as a result of the tectonic shifts uh, in the Jewish world at the end of the Middle Ages, with the migrations of from classical Ashkenaz to Eastern Europe, and therefore East Europe, Ashkenaz, and Ashkenazi Jewry, demographically very large by the 20th century. And uh, the same process, uh, uh, through the result of the expulsions of the Iberian Peninsula, Sepharad, a transplanted Sepharad that had moved to Southeastern Europe, to the Ottoman Empire, most uh, heavily around the uh, Aegean uh, area, um, Aegean Sea. Uh, and these two pillars were uh, really the main uh, uh, foundations of the Jewish 
uh, European Jewish world as it was, uh, uh, it, as it stood in 1939, and both, in fact, transcended even the very category of Europe itself. And the Holocaust, of course, played a major role in the dissolution and destruction of these two pillars. I will be focusing now on the, uh, this Judeo-Spanish world and this part of the story, and I will very briefly uh, outline here uh, what happened, uh, how it happened, so that we have uh, an understanding and as a story that can be told as one unit rather than broken up into uh, Macedonian Jewry, Greek Jewry, Bulgarian Jewry, etc., but really tell the story from this other optic that I am uh, outlining. The crucial period, of course, begins in 1492 with the mass emigration, uh, mass expulsions from Spain and then replenished by Maranos arriving periodically uh, to a new empire that actually controlled vast areas from Southeast Europe uh, all the way uh, to the Middle East and North Africa. And the Jews in the course of the century that followed 1492 settled along uh, the principal cities, the Sephardi Jews, along the trade routes and along the uh, uh, major uh, port cities of that area and created a new Ottoman uh, Levantine Sephardi Jewish community. And here I think it's interesting to look at uh, the map for a minute. And here, as you can see, broadly speaking, where this community is. And this is the, you have to look at this part of the map, which is really the, uh, the uh, zone of Ottoman influence, although, of course, Hungary was included for a period in the 17th century. But for centuries, really, from the 17th century onwards, we could say that, in fact, the Danube forms a kind of a boundary north of which is overwhelmingly Ashkenazi Jewry, south of which throughout the Balkan Peninsula and the Aegean, we have uh, the uh, Sephardi communities. And we can draw, in fact, their presence across uh, uh, trade routes that go from the Adriatic, Italy, and Venice, which is very important, through Sarajevo, uh, overland, through Serbia, down to Macedonia, to Salonika. Uh, and of course, other trade routes going from Istanbul or Constantinople, linking to Salonika as well, and then going from these north towards the Danube, towards, in fact, uh, Podolia, Poland, and the north. And of course, on the Asia Minor, minor side, all around the Aegean Sea, all the major uh, uh, trade routes in Western Asia Minor in the hinterland of Izmir. This is where uh, the Jewish uh, communities uh, were to be found mixed in a complex mosaic of multiple religious, ethnic uh, 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 groups, uh, uh, very multilingual uh, reality under one polity for centuries. That is to say, the Ottoman uh, uh, polity, uh, and ruled uh, were and lived as a distinctive group, as a distinctive millet, uh, uh, under uh, uh, semi-autonomous uh, rabbinical leadership, uh, and developed their own distinctive new uh, civilization, not, as has been sometimes claimed by um, uh, some uh, Spanish historians, as fossilized relics of old Sephardi, but as living uh, reality, as a living new kind of civilization, deeply uh, in negotiation with the cultures and uh, the customs and uh, the rule and the politics of, of the areas in which they found themselves, a, a Levantine Ottoman uh, reality. And, more, and most importantly, they developed, uh, of course, uh, uh, one particular uh, system of uh, 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 communication, which was very important, what, one glue that tied them all together, apart from several of these things uh, of, uh, that I mentioned, apart from being under this one particular polity, and that was, of course, the language that they developed, which was Ladino, which was, of course, the Spanish dialects that they took with them, which evolved oh, over time uh, with, with many loan words from Hebrew, Turkish, Greek, etc., from the areas in which they, they lived, uh, and written in Rashi Hebrew script. Now, this 
uh, community at this particular period of time and in the 16th, 17th centuries in the period of its settlement, uh, uh, of course, created and contributed and became an integral part of the larger Jewish world as well as the Ottoman world. The Jewish community itself is open to outside Western influences through education, but even more significantly, some of the most important challenges that face, which is really part of the story where I began, was the challenge, in fact, of the nation state. Because the Ottoman lands, or the Ottoman Empire is now uh, uh, in its weakest uh, period. It is being uh, slowly uh, overthrown by the rise of new nation states. And the Jews are going to be finding themselves in a completely different political reality as the centuries progress. So here is, for example, the Ottoman Empire at its height when it even had parts of Hungary. Uh, and the Jews are to be found all along here. As I said, the Sephardi Jews south of the Danube. And you can see that by the uh, period of um, a uh, period beginning with the beginning of the 19th century when Serbia will become uh, independent, then followed by Greece, then through the Balkan Wars uh, in 1912-13, uh, uh, northern Greece, Thrace, and uh, uh, that will also become uh, taken over by the Greek state in 1877-78, in 1878, uh, with the great wars uh, of that period. Bosnia and Herzegovina will be taken over by Austria-Hungary uh, with the capital city of Sarajevo, uh, and Bulgaria will emerge as a new state. So, what had been, in fact, all this land where the, which was the Sephardi unit uh, will be fragmenting until, as you can see here, the old Turkish territory is going to be a thin sliver uh, here uh, on all of this area, as you can see, and I point out the area south of the Danube here, up to, the, to Belgrade, and including, including Sarajevo, going down to the Dalmatian coast, is going to be under the new nation states. So in these new nation states, and we, I don't have time to go into, into it here, we will have the full panoply of the nationalization project that all nation states do. That is, say, compulsory education, compulsory monolingualism, or at least the imposition of a state language, uh, the uh, conscription of Jews. This whole reality is a dramatic one that is not the Ottoman Levantine imperial reality that the Sephardi community had uh, lived in over the centuries. Um, and um, eventually and slowly, these Jewish communities will begin to develop a sort of modus vivendi with the new regimes, will begin a kind of incipient nationalization. Some of this will go much further, for example, in Serbia, where, of course, they had been under the Sephardim of Serbia, had been under uh, 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 Serbian rule uh, since the beginning of the 19th century. Uh, Bulgaria will follow uh, later with the nationalization. Greece, of course, Salonika, which, of course, in some way, is the jewel and the crown of uh, this transplanted Sepharad, the largest Jewish community where the community itself was more than 50% of the population for most of the centuries after the arrival of the Sephardim at the end of the 15th century, really until 1912, uh, this community will have been only 30 years outside Ottoman rule when it will be uh, destroyed by the Nazis. Therefore, for the great bulk of that community, the memory of the Ottoman Empire was not some distant uh, remnant, but was, in fact, a lived uh, reality. Let me give you one concrete example of what some of the inadvertent um, um, results of this fragmentation were, and what happened to one particular family that I've encountered in my research, uh, which I think will make this process uh, really rather uh, vivid. And this concerns uh, a large family, Jivre, the Jivre family, that lived in Edirne or Adrianople, but that lived in northern uh, Thrace and all the way to Salonika, this whole area. Uh, a large family that was 
uh, of course, uh, based mostly in this uh, town of Edirne, Adrianople, which of course had been uh, four centuries, as you can see, not a border town, but the heart of Ottoman Rum Rumeli, or as, they, as the Turks would call it, Ottoman Empire, one unit of Turkey in Europe, uh, uh, across the Maritza River, uh, a very important part of uh, the trade routes and a very major Ottoman city. Now, as a result of the Balkan Wars of 1912-1913, uh, the border is cut, and we see that uh, here is the city, and the border is on uh, this, uh, uh, it just cuts off across the Maritza River, uh, right where we see it here. Now, this family um, had eventually spread to the town of Demotica, as they were known, or the Dimotichon, uh, as, as they called it, or the Dimotichon in Greece, in Greek, and the border cut off the town of Edirne, as you can see, from Demotika or Dimetoka in Turkish, which turned it into a border town. Now, the Givre family, the leading members of the family, had to make an important decision. Uh, where would they stay? The bulk of the family decided to stay in uh, Didimotichon because they were involved in the silk cocoon business, which was plugged into the trade to Salonika, where they had considerable amount of land. A few because of other uh, reasons, other prospects of, from where they were when the border came in 1912 and 13 of what had been really one land for four, five centuries almost, uh, cut this border. So, putatively, the members of the Givre family who stayed in Edirne became Turks or Turkish citizens. The ones who stayed in Dimetoka, which is really only a few miles away, as you can see, so across the border uh, from uh, uh, Turkey, uh, those became Greeks or Greek citizens. And yet, of course, it is one family, one widespread, large family uh, to be found all across both sides of this uh, particular border. Well, Turkey did not enter World War II. Greece, unfortunately, was conquered and invaded. And almost all, except two members of the family, perished with the deportation of the Demotica community on May 5. And by the way, when I started this research, uh, I uh, discovered, much to my amazement, um, that of the 740 uh, Jews uh, who had been deported from Demotica or Dimetoka, of whom 20 uh, survived, uh, the, th those, that community arrived, this was not my doing in terms of picking it, uh, arrived uh, in Auschwitz-Birkenau and was mostly uh, destroyed on May 16, 1943, exactly 62 years ago. It was completely by chance that I actually uh, discovered this. So I think what I've tried to show with this one very tragic example is that choices made and sometimes choices not made where borders cut across one unit will very frequently have very many different outcomes. And of course, I should hasten to say here that what I've outlined here can be duplicated um, among a lot of Ashkenazi communities as well that found themselves under different realities and with the vagaries of fate, some remained somewhere and survived and the rest uh, perished. But I thought it was important to zero in on one area of what I mean by this fragmentation of what was one polity and how it could actually itself affect uh, the uh, outcome in terms of Jewish life or Jewish death. Now, uh, I'd like to briefly outline what happens. Essentially, the processes of destruction and dissolution of Sepharad in the Balkans, or the Levantine Leite, uh, followed three paths. One, deportation to death camps by the Germans. Two, local mass murder by Germans. Three, local mass murder 
by local non-German elements. The first one is the one, in, and by the way, those three in terms of processes, of course, in many ways, again, follow what happened to Ashkenazi Jewry itself. It is not something that is unique to Sephardi Jewry. What I'm really pointing out from the vantage point of the historian of Jews is really talking about uh, the perspective from within this community to the uh, uh, process of destruction. But the deportations, the first um, uh, path that I actually identified, deportations by the Germans. As you can see, this is German rule at its height, deep into Russia, in Ukraine, uh, and further into Russia. Uh, countries like Romania, Bulgaria, Hungary, uh, allies of Germany, Croatia, a satellite state, Serbia conquered by Germany, Greece conquered in 1943 by Germany, these areas under German uh, rule, uh, Greece until 1943 uh, under Italian rule, and then in 1943 uh, under Nazi rule. So obviously what happens um, in terms of deportations, this will actually, uh, of course, be a direct result of the Nazi presence. Uh, and this will concern most notably uh, in terms of direct deportations initially, the areas of Greece controlled by Germany, and Germany, by the way, controlled the, the, a militarized zone on the Turkish border, but allowed Bulgaria, its allies, to occupy Thrace and parts, and indeed what is today uh, the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. Um, uh, this was part of the historic uh, Bulgarian claims on these lands, and Bulgaria was rewarded by this, but the border zone, and hence the Jews of Demotica, fall under the rule of uh, the Nazis, and of course, the major city, Salonika, falls under the rule of the Nazis. So, the first thing by deport, the first path of destruction by deportation is concerning these areas, but will also concern the Jews, in fact, of Thrace, and Macedonia that were controlled by Bulgaria, who handed them over to the Germans, who then deported them. First Salonika, before I come to that story. First Salonika, about 56,000 Jews before the war, uh, probably a little under 50,000 as people having fled from 1939 on or left. Um, Germany enters uh, uh, the city in, uh, as a result of coming to the help of its Italian allies, it co uh, occupies the city in 1941, and initially, and this is the dramatic difference at least to many uh, Ashkenazi centers where the Germans uh, entered, initially uh, not much happens as far as the Jews, except one thing, an archive, uh, a whole group for, uh, interested in looting the uh, archives and the cultural treasures of the community from the Institute for Judenforschung in Frankfurt, uh, and part of a special unit will come, uh, known as the Rosenberg uh, uh, Commando, uh, and will uh, take over the communal archives and the rich j books, uh, libraries of the community and ship them to Germany, and some remnants of which have now been found in Russia and being returned to both Salonika and copies being made in Israel uh, after uh, the fall of the Soviet Union because the Russian armies uh, uh, got hold of, the, of these archives uh, in Germany at the end of World War II. Apart from this, for about a year, nothing much happens in Salonika. Uh, there is hunger and starvation throughout the city, so the Jews, the Greeks, all suffer under the same uh, uh, tough conditions, uh, but the Jewish community is on the whole left alone, uh, and there is, uh, 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 of course, petty uh, acts of, of violence here and there. There's very little news of what's happening anywhere else. Um, and uh, the Greek municipality takes uh, full uh, advantage of the situation in order to finally claim the Salonika, the greatest Jewish cemetery, the largest Jewish cemetery of Europe, um, that of Salonika that had been there since the 15th century uh, to uh, uh, basically take over the land as part of its urbanism uh, projects and in fact use, destroy the cemetery uh, and in fact uh, whose gravestones uh, were used in the construction uh, of the building projects of uh, the Aristotle University on 
who's, uh, the, which stands on the grounds of this particular cemetery. This project had been in the works for about 10, 15 years before the World War II, but uh, the municipality had not been able to do anything about it. Beginning of change is July of 1942. 2,000 Jews are uh, taken, male Jews, taken to labor battalions uh, after being made to undergo humiliating exercises in the middle of, uh, of the city, uh, in the Liberty Square, uh, and they are made to be ransomed by the community, uh, and they will be uh, 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 ransomed back at the, at the, with the payment of a huge amount of money. Beginning of 1943, just as elsewhere the process of destruction is being stepped up, things process very quickly. Uh, there is, of course, a Judenrat, the Jewish council, with uh, a rabbi Koretz at its head, who is somewhat docile in terms of doing what the Germans ask him to do. The, the deportations, they are asked, they, the Jews are told that they are being uh, taken to the town, or to the um, uh, city of Krakow. Uh, uh, in Poland, uh, and uh, they will um, uh, uh, be, uh, as of March uh, 15 of 1943, they will start uh, to be deported. Uh, it's very rapid in 19 transports until August. A couple of others included uh, in, these, uh, uh, in these kind of transports from other communities, for example, the Demotica or the Demotikon community that I talked about, which was right on the border, was joined to one of the transports in the Salonika community. Uh, and um, the uh, process of destruction, therefore, is very clear. In August, in March, between March and August 1943, the whole community is deported. In August of 1943, Salonika is Judenrein. There are no Jews left in Salonika as of that period, except a couple who may have hid here and there. Um, the Bulgarian annexed areas, and this is uh, uh, continuing the process of uh, the deportations by the Germans in the end, at the same period, the Nazis uh, ask uh, for 20,000 Jews to be delivered by Bulgarians. Bulgaria has 50,000 Jews. It has been given these lands, Macedonia and northern Greece, uh, by, um, uh, uh, by the Germans. And it has, in fact, a, a pro-German regime. Uh, and um, in 1943, the demand comes in early 1943 for the handing over of 20,000 Jews. Bulgaria never recognized the Jews of these Jews of these annexed lands as Bulgarian Jews, and therefore, when this demand came, it willingly uh, handed over the Jews of Skopje or Uskup under the Turkish name, Ottoman name, uh, the, the Jews of Manastir or Bit, uh, under the Turkish name of Bitola here in Macedonia, and all of these Jewish communities of the Thracian uh, border. So we have. 4,000 Jews from Thrace um, uh, that are put in four barges eventually by the Bulgarians, handed over on the Danube, uh, at the Danube uh, uh, to the Germans, and which are then shipped to Treblinka with no survivors. 7,400 Jews of Macedonia in the same period taken over by rail to transit camps and then by rail taken over to Treblinka as well. So they... Uh, uh, also will not have any survivors. So we've talked about deportation by the Germans. One, Salonika, German control areas of the north. Two, the newly occupied lands of Bulgaria uh, that are new Bulgarians, as it were, and the Jews are excluded from that. And of course, uh, in the end, the third uh, part is going to be the rest of Greece, as far as the Germans are concerned, because the rest of, of Greece is going to be occupied, which had been under Italian rule, until uh, the Mussolini falls and Italy asked for an armistice in September of 1943. This whole area then is occupied by the uh, uh, Germans, uh, southern Greece, most notably Athens. The Italians had not handed over any Jews in spite of repeated demands. In fact, this whole area had become a refuge for Jews fleeing from the north. and. Um, in this period, the process basically follows the same path. Um, April, uh, for, for a while, when the Germans arrive, nothing much is done. They do ask the Jews to register. The rabbi of Athens, Rabbi Barzillai, does not 
uh, respond, burns the communal records, and actually uh, flees, um, uh, is taken in by the Greek resistance, and therefore the Germans have a much harder time um, in getting their hands on the Jews. But uh, when uh, the, the process uh, uh, accelerates, they will manage to get their hands of, on, on, on the Jews uh, in the course of 1944. Um, uh, especially in April 1944, where major deportation will begin. And the small towns such as Larissa, Yanina, they are deported in this period as well. So we could say that by July of 1944, most, almost all of the Jews of Greece were deported, uh, of, of the under, they were living on the Greek, including, uh, of course, all these zones that I talked about before. The death rate of the, this um, deportations is uh, one of the highest in terms of the pre-war population of 75,000, 87,000 will die. Um, there's a whole other lecture I could give about uh, um, these Sephardic Jews in the camps, um, um, for the, the problems they encountered, for example, not being able to speak Yiddish, um, not making themselves understood, sometimes being able to speak only as a language co communication in French, which they had learned in their er earlier schooling uh, through the school network of the Alliance Israël Universelle, which is, to me, has certainly made me pause, uh, where the language of culture uh, and civilization, quote unquote, that had been transmitted to them by this French Jewish organization became the language of survival in the camps. It's a kind of very uh, sad and ironic twist. Uh, Ladino, of course, made them uh, outsiders until they were understood to be Jews. Um, there are going to be 200 Sephardim in the uh, famous Zonde Commando uprising that blew up one of the crematoria in September of 1944. And a little known fact, Jews from, uh, uh, Sephardic Jews from Salonika were used in the cleanup of the rubble of the Warsaw Ghetto after the uprising and were used for that particular purpose, uh, shipped off from Auschwitz to do so. I should also open one bracket, I won't have time to go into it, but uh, many thousands of Sephardi Jews that had come from the Sephardi heartland and core areas that had moved to France uh, were also caught uh, in the machinery of destruction and perish through deportations uh, in this period as well. So these, broadly speaking, are the local uh, deportations by the, uh, 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 the Germans. Uh, the, 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 there is, I've now entered my second category of the process of uh, destruction, and that is local mass murder by Germans. And this will concern most notably the Jews of uh, Serbia, uh, uh, and it's a fairly unique story. There are 11,000 Sephardi Jews in Belgrade, um, and Germany uh, enters uh, Serbia in April 1941, and unlike in Salonika, uh, here the process of destruction is extremely rapid. Uh, the males from 16 to 60 are put into labor battalions, uh, and uh, made to work on the very harsh activity. Uh, um, the, this, uh, the, um, the, the rest of the population, of course, has to wear all kinds of uh, uh, distinctive signs, including armbands and uh, economic spoliation measures, ar arianization, all of these things follow with great rapidity. Because of partisan activity, uh, uh, that is to say, resistance to the Germans by the Serbs, the German Wehrmacht, the German army, decides upon a policy of retaliation, a retaliation of 100 uh, people killed per one German killed, and very handily, Jews, together with other Ser uh, Serbs who are in these uh, labor battalions, are going to be picked up and killed as a result of this action. So by early of 1942, almost all of these male Jews of this age uh, they, uh, died uh, in, uh, in this particular way. The remaining women, children, older men, uh, about 7,500 uh, were put in a camp right across Belgrade on the Sava River here. Actually, the river is right, the map, the Belgrade is slightly off here. On, it's literally on, uh, right in Belgrade, and it's on the other side uh, of the Sava River, and that area was known as Zamun, or Zem, Zem, Zemin, 
uh, or Zemun, and of course used to be the old Ottoman Habsburg border for centuries. There is a camp uh, that is built here, uh, uh, and here we have a unique episode where a gas van is brought over, uh, unique really outside Eastern Europe, where 100 people at a time are put in these gas vans, driven from Zamun to, uh, through downtown Belgrade while being gassed and being buried in uh, uh, ravines on the other side of the town. By uh, mid-1942, it's all over all of the Jews of this town, uh, uh, of, sorry, of Serbia in this way, uh, had perished who were under German control. That is the, one of the first countries where no Jews are left. Uh, and it is also has got the distinctiveness of, in fact, especially outside Eastern Europe, of the usage of a gas van in a major city. Uh, and uh, the uh, uh, Serbia, ha uh, at least in Ger the Germans, have resolved the final solution or have, have reached the final solution uh, already in mid-1942. For one moment, if I then put in the other optic, however, these names, I have to say, and here my other optic, which I had started out with, which is that of the historian of Jews and historian of Sephardi Jewry, is Zamun and Belgrade. Zamun, under the Austrians, under Habsburg rule, was known as Zemlin. And Zemlin, of course, is famous in Jewish history as the place where the famous rabbi Yehuda Alkali, one of the early proto-Zionist 19th century rabbis and a major thinker, lived and professed. Zemun, or Zemlin, was of course also a major publishing center of, uh, of, of Ladino, especially uh, uh, newspapers. Uh, uh, in fact, it was an area where these publications could take place and then be spirited back into the Ottoman Empire because it would escape the censorship under Abdul Hamid uh, II uh, towards the end of the Ottoman Empire. So almost all of these names are redolent with other stories than just a suburb of Belgrade where there was a town. These are, in fact, very rich Jewish geographies that have uh, very uh, deep meaning that once you begin to uh, explore these names and in fact the transformations of the names and their Jewish names, their multiple names, other empires and states, we reach into very other, dif very different other kinds of stories. Uh, and to uh, end uh, the uh, unfortunate uh, uh, process, the, the third uh, uh, one is local mass murder and here it is really uh, committed by the Croatians, uh, who uh, will, of course, have Sarajevo under their control. The Germans, by the way, will blow up the big Sephardi synagogue of Sarajevo when they enter. They hand it over this whole area uh, to a new country that comes into being that had never historically existed, uh, uh, the country of Croatia in the modern period. Uh, and in this new state, which is which has a fascist uh, uh, regime, involves itself in a genocidal war with a genocidal uh, enterprise of getting rid of the Serbs. Hundreds of thousands of Serbs are killed in local camps to whom are added the Jews uh, that they can actually control. Interestingly, by the way, the coastal region, which is the Dalmatian coast here, until 1943 was under Italian control, and the Jews who made it there could actually save themselves because uh, the Italians would not hand them over. Uh, it's estimated that around 25,000 Jews, about half of them uh, Sephardim uh, from uh, this Bosnian area uh, and also the rest Ashkenazim from Zagreb also perish in these camps. The rem remnants in 1943 of about 7,000 or so are handed over um, by uh, the Croatians uh, to the Germans. I should make one uh, very brief mention for a unique part of the story before I conclude and that is of course, the case of Bulgaria. Because the Bulgarian case is a very complicated one uh, and really requires considerable more research. We hear a lot these days, actually, from Bulgaria as to its exemplary treatment of the Jews during uh, World War II. I've already mentioned that, in fact, these conquered territories 
of Macedonia and uh, Thrace, the Jews are got rid of. But remember that 20,000 were asked and 4,000 uh, from Thrace and 7,400 from Macedonia uh, were handed over. That does not add up to 20,000 in early 1943. The uh, government and the leading anti-Semite uh, 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 that is uh, leading anti-Semitic elements within it decide at that moment that they will end, top up the number to 20,000 by handing over additional Jews from Bulgaria proper. That's say Jews who had been under Bulgarian rule since 1878. Um, and um, this number and then eventually it, as a prelude to the deportation handing over of all of the Jews. It is in this period that uh, and it would have involved in fact first of all the, the, the community of Kustendil or Kustendil as it used to be known in Turkish under Ottoman rule and um, uh, the leader of that community Yaakov Baruch gets to hear of this in fact they had observed across Bulgaria the deportation of these Jews. You remember they had made it to Danube and to actual rail, rail, uh, railroads from within Bulgaria handed over to Germany. So the community was in a great state of anxiety. Anti-Semitic legislation had been put in. A very tough uh, Jewish uh, racialist uh, discriminat discriminatory me measures had been taken. A lot of major um, hardship imposed upon the Jews by labor battalions of people being uh, drafted into, uh, especially young people working under very hard conditions. But Yaakov Baruch, who gets to hear of it, appeals to his childhood friend, who himself actually is conservative and uh, uh, rather right-wing, Dmitry Peshev, the vice president of parliament. And this then eventually, through his agitation, uh, initiates a whole uh, rebellion by segments of the public opinion, the newspapers, trade unions, professional organizations, as well as uh, 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 other parliamentarians protesting the handing over of the Jews. Now, since these were foreign Jews, and foreign Jews are some of the quote-unquote foreign Jews, that's one of the most diff uh, dangerous things to be during the Holocaust because there's nobody that stands up for them. But here, um, there was, of course, Bulgarian nationalism itself that got uh, activated, uh, and decided, uh, basically refusing to hand over even persecuted fellow Bulgarians, as they were considered, uh, to the Germans. So, in fact, the deportations are stopped because of this input, because it becomes a political uh, hot potato, it becomes very difficult, and in fact, as far as these deportations are concerned, we now know that because, of course, German armies were not physically present, there was uh, uh, there was uh, a, a whole element of um, uh, public sphere that was still in existence that could be activated. This was an authoritarian, but not really a fascist government. So popular opinion could, in fact, have a say. So these deportations are stopped. Uh, 20,000 Jews from Sofia, the capital, are uh, 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 deported nevertheless to the provinces to uh, other Jewish communities which are made to house them in the provinces, their, pop their large number of their property, their property confiscated, but they are not deported and there were plans that this was an interim step before they were deportation or others believe that in fact this was a way of gaining time to show the Germans that some anti-Jewish action was being taken. By that time, uh, 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 th we're talking well into 1943, uh, the tides of war had begun to change uh, and uh, there began to be a great deal of fear that in fact if Germany loses the war then somebody will be ma made to pay for all of this and the King Boris at that time dies and nothing further happens uh, as far as these deportations are concerned. So rather miraculously but also giving it credit where its credit is due because of segments of pu public opinion Bulgarian jury, in fact, severely traumatized, impoverished, but nevertheless survives uh, World War II. But the Sepharad of the Balkans did not really survive. Uh, these, this group, the Bulgarian jury, 
which was in fact the most uh, substantial group that survived after the war because of its tra uh, traumatization, leaves en masse for the State of Israel in 1948. Uh, there are only remnants that return, about 1,000 to Salonika, three or 4,000 to Athens. There are only remnants from all of these communities that uh, manage uh, to come back. There is really, in fact, no particular survival of, uh, of the Sephirad of the Balkans. And I think perhaps nothing is more symbolic of what happened uh, in terms of the terrible blow uh, delivered by the Holocaust on uh, this core uh, 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 section of uh, uh, the Jewish world as what happens uh, in Ladino. Totally symbolic of what happens is the closing down of El Mesagero, the last newspaper in the world printing in Rashi Hebrew script in 1941 when the Germans uh, arrive in, in, uh, in Salonika. Uh, lots, Ladino had been transliterated into Latin script in other places like uh, Turkey uh, and uh, other areas, uh, but of course the whole wealth of this literature and the repository of the culture was in fact in Rashi Hebrew script. And the last remaining newspaper in that is symbolic really of the coming to an abrupt end of that cultural heritage in terms of direct accessibility and contact uh, to that culture. Uh, the Judeo-Spanish culture of the Balkans, uh, uh, therefore, in many ways, disappears around uh, this uh, particular um, uh, trauma uh, of uh, the Holocaust, uh, and Ladino, with it, receives a deadly uh, blow. Salonika, Sarajevo, and many other cities were each known uh, as very frequently what they would be called as Jerusalem of the Balkans. Uh, Sarajevo was known as the Jerusalem of the Balkans. There were many Jerusalems. And the notion of it being a Jerusalem of a place is about the embeddedness in that place. Some places were even known as Chika Yerushalayim. Small Jerusalems, even small towns were known under that. Uh, these Jerusalems uh, disappeared forever. So just as the Holocaust destroyed the Ashkenazi heartland of Eastern Europe, it therefore played a central role in the end of Sepharad in the Balkans. Thank you. <laughs>